Hello everyone, it's really lovely to, to have you here and I hope you're enjoying the Virtual Island Summit so far. Um, I know we are. Um, thank you also to everyone who's sent supportive messages and chats already uh, looking forward to this session. Um, so it's been really helping to build the atmosphere and we're really excited to share it with you. Um, for those of you who perhaps haven't been to a session yet, um, you'll see on your uh, pathable um, screen uh, on the right hand side uh, under polls, uh, there's an opportunity there to ask questions for the speakers. So that's where you should put um, any questions you have. Uh, we've also got a little question there because we'd like to know whereabouts you're from. Um, but yeah, that, if you could um, pop questions in there during the session, that would be great. And I'll be using that to uh, guide the debate as we, as we go through. So to start off with, uh, we thought we would just be uh, helpful to share a little bit about Edge and our work, uh, a little bit of background, and then I'm going to introduce you to five fantastic colleagues from around the world uh, who are going to tell us a little bit about their work and their perspectives. Um, so Edge is a UK-based education charity. We're all about trying to make education more relevant and more focused on the real world, uh, from primary school all the way through to university, through things like real world projects, employer engagement in education, focusing on skills like communication and team working rather than just rote learning for exams. I know that's dear to lots of your hearts. One of the areas that is really dear to us as well is uh, looking at island education around the UK and internationally. Uh, a couple of years ago now we set up uh, a network of colleagues involved in island education uh, in some of the islands around the British Isles and I'm delighted that some of the colleagues are with us today uh, and we've been expanding that network and uh, joining colleagues internationally uh, as well uh, and particularly shout out to colleagues at the University of Strathclyde who we recently collaborated on uh, with, with on a, a seminar looking at ocean education which was a really great opportunity to meet new colleagues from around the world. So today's question is really about trying to prepare young people for the future of education. And that is a question that's really important, whether you're on a mainland, in a country in the middle of a continent or on a small island. Um, but we know that it comes with particular challenges in an island context. And that's why we thought it'd be a really good uh, topic for us to, to debate and discuss today. Um, for those of you who might have seen it on Facebook, I did an interview um, last, last week with Neil Simcoe, who is one of the vice principals at the University of the Highland and Islands. Um, uh, they've just published an island strategy, which is really interesting and, and very cool for, for colleagues at this, uh, this um, seminar because it puts the islands right at the heart of what they're doing. Um, so I've put the link to that in the chat. And if you're interested, you might like to have a look at that um, after the session too. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce the first of our panelists. We're gonna be kind of broadly making our way up the age range as we, as we talk to the different colleagues that we meet today, uh, starting with uh, the kind of early years and development there. So uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anna Baldacino, who is a lecturer in the Fac Faculty of Education at the University of Malta, although proving her international credentials and is actually going to be joining us from Canada today uh, from a different island. Um, so Anna, can I uh, welcome you to the stage and ask you to, to share your presentation. Okay, coming up. Just a second. Okay, share screen. Great, thanks, Anna. That's no, just coming no, up now. No, no, this is no, no, no. That's the. Uh... That's the wrong one. <laughs> share screen. Here. Perfect. Should work. Great, there thank you. Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Oli, for the introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us live. Um, as Oli said, I'm a, lecture, a visiting lecturer at the University of Malta, and I am also the uh, founder, co founder, and president of the Early Childhood Education, Early Childhood Development Ed Education of Malta. And uh, we, it was the first time ever, like it, there has never been an association for early childhood educators. And uh, I think it, we have done some positive work. It's been up for four years, and I will also talk a little bit more about it when we get um, to the continuous development uh, for, for educators. So my presentation today is about how in Malta we prepare educators for uh, to become early childhood educators or kindergarten educators. Um, I, st I wanted to start off with this um, slide to put you in perspective for those of you who do not know where Malta is or how big Malta is or how small Malta is. Sometimes it's not even shown on the map as you can see on the big map over here. 
there's a, an arrow. There has to be an arrow, otherwise you won't see Malta. You might miss it. Um, it's actually the tenth smallest country in the world. But as you can see from the population, we have over half a million now people. So it's very densely populated, but it is still an island. Now, going on to our pre topic today, these are basically the qualifications needed for someone to work in childcare centers and kindergartens in Malta. Um, the current Education Act recognizes qualifications ranging from a level four European qualification framework, which we'll call EQF, to a level six qualification, which is a degree. The level four is equivalent to an A level, whereas the level six is equivalent to a degree. So you can see that there is quite a range between those two levels. And, uh, uh, but still, somebody with a level four can teach in a kindergarten uh, setting. So what happens in Malta, because of its smallness and because of lack of resources, human resources, when somebody has a level six in ECE, early childhood, okay, most probably, if you're applying for work in a state um, school, you're going to be placed in grades one and two, okay, instead of kindergarten, because there is a higher demand for those teachers, okay, and at the same time, there is still demand in the uh, kindergarten level, but there are more people with level four. So the government can employ these people with a level four instead of the level six that a lot of us as educators and academics would like to have in kindergarten and childcare settings. Then to work as a manager of a childcare settings, the level is level five. This is based on the level four, usually, and then you have an additional two years. And you will end up with a, what we call a higher diploma. Um, we also would love to see a top-up level that goes to a level six, so that goes to a degree. Um, there is a plan in process, but it's still work in progress. Uh, by the University of Malta to do this. And this would give the opportunity to educators who already have a level four or a level five to advance in their um, knowledge, right? Or in their qualifications. And hopefully this will come in sooner rather than later. And a two year part-time course Will be offers for will be offered sorry for those who have a level five and a five year part time course for those who have a level four or a stipulated number of years of experience. But of course there are I don't have more detail for now because it's still in the works. Now, when we get down to professionalization of educators in the early years, I feel that there is an inconsistency in the training programs that Malta offers. So even though Malta is a very small country, it still has a number of private institutions that offer a level four, together with the College of Arts and Technology and the Institute of Education. The last two are um, government entities that provide a level four qualification as well. However, all these do not offer the same or a standardized level four training. So they can you know, vary from an, uh, something that is called an award. And this entails 60 to 90 ECTSs, the European Credit Transfer System. And um, there's another one that has 120 ECTSs. And then there are particular courses, short courses, that are nine ECTSs. But they, are, they all result in a level four. So the problem here is that 
when these students finish their studying and are searching for employment, if the employer has no knowledge of these different types of training, what is the content of their level four training, uh, they will just, you know, employ whoever is available. And that, unfortunately, lowers the quality of education in the earlier sector. Um, we also, I go to the second um, point here, basing training needs to start at level six. This is something that a lot, a lot of us who are advocates of the early years sector wish to happen. I think it would be best if we really want high quality early childhood settings, both childcare settings and kindergarten settings. I think we need to start training at a level six. So that would be the first qualification, the minimum qualification that one needs to be working with these children who are the most vulnerable, but the most important. It is the most important stage of their life. So we need to have uh, highly qualified educators. And if we have these, children, these educators adequately trained, this does not only benefit the children, but also the country in as much as there will be less expenses on social benefits, lower rate of criminality, better social cohesion, and more income from taxes, because income taxes, I'm saying, because people will be opting for high paying jobs, right? So they will be charged more. Now, to obtain a high quality early childhood education, we need adequately trained staff. So one cannot happen without the other. And I think that is where we are struggling right now in Malta. Now, the Education Act is being revised is my third point. Well, uh, the Education Act that we presently have dates back to 1988, with a revision that was done in 1991. S having said that, a number of legal notices have been uh, passed since then, of course, and currently it is being revised again. We are hoping that soon it will be out as well. However, um, the information we have right now is that the part about early childhood education is not being changed. So they are not asking for higher qualifications. It is still a level four that is being asked for um, educators to become um, early childhood educators. So as an association, which we call EGDAM in short, Early Childhood Development Association of Malta, is actually has been for the past several months advocating that educators in the early years who would like to advance in their level of certification be given that opportunity. And we hope that it happens. Then we have adequate trainers of managers. That again needs more work to be done on it because uh, a level five we feel is not enough because there are certain aspects of managing a childcare centers that are not included in the training. And of course, continuous development, which is a big thing. Uh, again, as EGDAM, we offer it. We offer nine monthly sessions for educators and it's always early childhood educators. And we get uh, international and local uh, speakers for them. To go to my last slide, which is about multiculturalism and COVID. This is what the present market needs. And I think we need some work here as well to train our staff. Since we um, joined the EU in 2004, we've had an influx of uh, immigrants and we, we can get a classroom where you have more international students than the Maltese. And remember in Malta, we have two official languages, Maltese and English. And I think that in the training of educators, there needs to be a credit 
where they are taught how to teach Maltese and English as a second language. And we also need to be aware of the differences that we have in class and actually celebrate these differences instead of uh, looking at them as a burden. And about the COVID-19, I think everybody has the same uh, kind of uh, challenges. This was a sudden change for all educators. You can imagine for the younger children how difficult it is to be in front of a screen trying to learn something. Okay, we've had good educators um, who really did a good job of interacting with their children and making it fun for them, but it is still a challenge. And there was no training. And I still personally think that there needs to be much more training about this. And most especially, there needs to be, uh, educators need to become aware of the mental and emotional stress that these children might be going through and perhaps lessen their expectations of these students. And I think that more training needs to be done about outdoor learning, which is being promoted as one of the you know, new norm for teaching. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't overrun my time. No, Holly. that was perfect, Anna. Such an interesting presentation. Thank you so much Thank for kicking us off. Uh, it's Thank lovely you. to see your passion for you know, bringing professionalism to the early years. Uh, and I think, as you said, that's, that's really important for Ireland and for everyone around yes. the world to really focus on that early, uh, early stage. Um, you sparked yes. some really interesting comments and thoughts whilst you were going through. So just to mention a couple of those, some really interesting comments and thoughts around sustainability and around the content of early years education. You know, what should we be including there? Um, but also a really interesting uh, question about people asking whether you offer your training elsewhere which made me think about uh, opportunities for you know links between islands which are which are kind of central so we'll come back thank to some you. of those themes um at the end but anna thank you so thank much you. for starting us off That's thank great. you um wonderful i've now got the pleasure to introduce our second panelist uh jan gimbert is uh, the school improvement advisor at the isle of man's department of education sport and culture um, i've had the pleasure of visiting jan uh, over on the isle of man and she's a founder member of our uh, network so it's really a pleasure to, to welcome you jan um, do you want to uh, start sharing your screen and uh, we'll be moving up from early years uh, into the world of school with, with Jan's presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Jan. Over to you. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Well, it's afternoon here. It's probably a different time in, in other parts of the world. Uh, thank you, Ollie, for inviting me to be part of uh, this group this afternoon. Um, just to give a bit of context, like uh, Anna did, about Malta. Um, the Isle of Man uh, is an island that's in the middle of the Irish Sea, where between uh, Ireland, England, Scotland, we're about 32 miles long, 10 miles wide, population of about 80,000. And we have uh, 32 primary schools, five secondary schools, and one college of further and higher education, Uni uh, University College Isle of Man. Uh, my contribution to the session this afternoon is to consider the importance of, of meta-learning and employability skills in the Isle of Man education system, to reflect on why curriculum choice post-14 post should include appropriate vocational qualifications alongside a core GCSE offer, and to review how leadership decisions and behaviour has been crucial to support improvements in this area on the island over the last uh, three to four years. Our curriculum statement on the Isle of Man is called Essentials for Learning and the aim of which is to inspire learners to flourish in life and that's, and that's a big statement uh, but part of our Essentials for Learning curriculum is the learning dispositions or the six R's. Uh, the six R's include reflectiveness, resourcefulness, resilience, relationships which are positive, readiness to learn and remember and they're based on the work that Guy Claxton undertook originally um, he had four hours then five hours and we have six um, the learning dispositions or six hours in some form underpin learning in our schools from four-year-olds to 18-year-olds but also linked to higher education and professional learning in the workplace part of my role is to uh, focus on particularly the, the 14 to 19 age group uh, and what I realised when I was looking at that transition uh, from year 11 onwards was how complicated the language is around employability skills. 
So as part of a review of our record of achievement, which hadn't really been touched for about 20 years, what I did was I evaluated this, this full range of language. Um, so when I looked at what our 16 year olds are exposed to, I looked at six R's, LE dimensions, which again comes from uh, Guy Claxton's work, personal learning and thinking skills, Duke of Edinburgh award language, work experience language, junior achievement language and other providers. And I also look more broadly at things like uh, CBI and, and STEM. And what I realized early on that, that, the, that there was some commonality and teamwork, problem solving and communication dropped out as, as key words to frame those skills in, in all of those different uh, types of uh, ways of looking at this language of employability. Then um, we looked as a group with um, middle and senior leaders in, in our, across our schools and, and UCM, and we tried to work out what, what other words we needed. And by doing that piece of work, we came out with resilience, self-awareness, and the ability to learn. And then middle leaders and, and senior leaders in school worked with groups of students, and we developed very simple prompts that then could be used by students in that sort of key stage four onwards transition to write personal statements using experiences, not just in school, but around life-wide learning as well. So if they attended cadets or if they went to dance or did music, they could reflect on their opportunities that they'd had outside school as well as inside school in terms of developing those skills. Um, so that was our first piece of work that we did. And we, we sort of did a soft launch on it and we, and we tried and we, we saw how it worked. One of the key decisions that we made um, with, with leaders was to ensure use of that record of achievement, that sort of change that we've made. So as part of our access to further education, whether it's in our school sit form or whether it's in our College of Further and Higher, higher Education, um, part of the interview process is, involves a discussion around, around those employability skills. Um, the next thing that we did was we looked at a big careers event uh, that we do each year at the employment and skills event and we and we sort of use that language in terms of activities that that people attending that event young people attending that event would would focus around so we had employer bingo uh, and when we developed it a little bit further last year and, and that's been very successful and where we are with this at the moment is where we're developing it even further and widening the use of this employability language um, to include a detailed self-assessment and, and coaching support for, for young people who are undertaking internships during summer holidays or actually are, part, are undertaking other work-based uh, learning uh, at, you know, at, at some point uh, in their lives that isn't necessarily paid but is, is part of their development. One of the key things to say about um, this, this language is that it's a translator. There is no requirement for individual schools or individual employers to adopt this language. It's literally just the way of framing that language for young people. So there is that commonality and they can learn from the experiences and they can relate the learning that they have in the workplace to what they've done previously and what they will do in the future. So the value of these broad transferable meta-learning or employability skills also, I feel, needs to be supported by a curriculum that includes vocational options from, from key stage four onwards. One of our key decisions at the start of this process, perhaps in terms of developing a vocational offer, was for me as, as part of a group that I chair with, with senior leaders uh, across our system, um, was to define what a vocational qualification was and, and you can see what our definition is on there and for your purists um, you can see that, that's a, that it's actually a, a combination of, of pre-vocational and vocational but for us we needed that working definition so what we then set out to do was we then set out to uh, increase options for vocational qualifications linked to local employment opportunities and, and we had to be quite creative how we, how we did that. We use a range of exam boards for this now. We use BTEX at, at pretty much most levels. Uh, we, we've developed a really good relationship with SQA and we use um, national progression awards and skills for work qualifications uh, in that space. And there are other qualification uh, awarding bodies that, that we engage with as well. 
And there's a, there's a saying out there that you, you value what you measure. So part of us looking at this development was to, to see how many vocational entries that we, we have on Ireland uh, over, over you know, a, a period of time. So in 2018, when I first started measuring this, it was around about 7% uh, at, at 120 guided learning hours, so like a GCSE equivalent size qualification. Last year it was 9% and I suspect it's around about 11% currently, but I haven't had time to, to do that piece of work. Um, the other thing about vocational learning is you can't just start it at, at 14. Um, I think you have to start it earlier. And, and in our primary schools, our, our curriculum's a bit different. We have a creative curriculum, which is underpinned by metacognition, by six hours of learning dispositions. And what I mean by that is, for every sort of six week block, primary schools perhaps come up with students, you know, an area, a project, a, a context. So they might choose something like pirates. And then what they would do is perhaps do some science around forces, some numeracy, some literacy, a story, uh, maybe some geography, some history. But all of those would be underpinned by uh, six R's um, and by cross curricular links mm. and at key stage three we've got a couple of secondary schools that have started to develop project based learning through a core skills curriculum or a quest curriculum and, and the EDGE Foundation have been really helpful to those schools in particular in sort of developing that and perhaps joining this, this curriculum together. Um, in our tertiary education uh, 16 to 18 year olds approximately a third of our entries are vocational, but in addition to this, we'll have about 10% of 16-year-olds and about 25% of 18-year-olds entering straight into the workforce. And obviously, they may or may not have access to uh, additional uh, education as part of uh, the training packages that they're offered. So our next steps really are to continue to develop this, to continue particularly to develop the, the use of uh, employability language but also map curriculum pathways linked to employment opportunities and really start promoting that across the island. Uh, one of the key things that I think has, has really helped us in terms of moving this forward on the Isle of Man has been leadership behaviours. We had a new political administration uh, in 2016 and part of their programme for government was to uh, have a priority which, which states we have an education system which matches our skills requirements now and in the future. And, and that links very clearly to, to the two areas that I've just spoken to. Uh, and in addition to that, um, I meet, I chair a group called the 14 to 19 Consortium. They're senior leaders from each of our five secondary schools and a vice principal from um, our College of Further and Higher Education. And, and working together, um, we came up with a guiding principle for, for how we were going to operate as a group. And you can see that on the screen now, cohesion, partnership working, effective communication. And, and that has been really key in terms of us developing a joint strategic approach to doing this. It's reduced, I think, the, the chance of fracturing of the system as we've developed it. And actually, it's, it's helped us focus on whole island progress rather than individual progress of, of individual schools or, or UCM. Um, and I couldn't resist this. I used to be a science teacher. So here's my, my uh, vocational and uh, employability uh, helix. But basically, we, we, we have a curriculum choice now, in, including vocational. Um, you know, our young people, I think, get, get a good deal in terms of uh, the choice that they have post-14. Post um, we also have this clear focus on employability and meta skills right from when young, young children start, start school and right the way through. Um, but actually, the, the key to actually keeping these strands together, because I think there is a, a sort of dynamic relationship between the two, is the leadership behaviours. And it's about our leaders, either political leaders or um, school leaders or other people who have a role in this, or the stakeholders, perhaps business leaders, um, valuing um, this idea of meta-learning and employability skills and actually uh, promoting them as a, as a positive uh, aspect of our, of our island life. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jan. Really, ple real pleasure to have you with us. Um, and I think one of the things that I just wanted to draw out uh, for, from our kind of wider work together um, is, is just about how uh, we've found that islands can be such an important source of lessons for each other, but also for the mainland. So certainly for the Isle of Man and the other schools and the other islands that we work with around Britain, uh, they're trialing really innovative and exciting things uh, and able to use the fact that they're small and nimble to try things that actually then have a really wide um, kind of applicability uh, and the project-based learning work that Jan's mentioned is just one example of that so uh, I'd love to hear a bit more about that uh, at the end because lots of questions and lots of uh, feedback from uh, colleagues who are listening was uh, was interested in the kind of area of project-based learning uh, and around native languages as well so we'll come back to those. Jan thank yeah. you so much that's absolutely great. Uh, we're going to spin spin the globe now and we're going to uh, cross to Curtis Greaves. Um, Curtis is from uh, the uh, Caribbean Association of Principals of Secondary Schools uh, and Curtis's uh, school went back this week so we might get the joyous noise of children in the background which is just going to make it all the better. So welcome Curtis. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning here in St Vincent and the Grenadines from St Vincent and Grenadines. Um, so a pleasant good morning or good afternoon wherever you're at around the world. And I'm coming to you from St. Vincent and the Grandines, where it's comprised of 32 islands and keys with a population about 110,000. Um, the, the main line is St. Vincent and the Grandines. And in St. Vincent, we have about 60, 66 primary school, 130 early childhood centers and 27 secondary schools with four technical institutes and one tech, um, community college. What is important though, is that in 2004, the present administration led by Dr. Ralph Gonsalves took on the responsibility of starting an education revolution. And during that education revolution, the government made it mandatory that every child at the age of 10 plus, 11 plus, will move into secondary school from grade six to, to form one um, or grade seven. And our students have been moving from one level to the next. Um, we use the CPA, which is the Caribbean, Caribbean Assess for Primary Exit Exam, which will tell them where they are placed in the various secondary schools across the island. Um, our Education Act here in St. Vincent Grandin was revised in 2006. And in, the, in this country of ours, we, we are seeking to develop a strong education system where the government is helping young people to go to university through the economic disadvantage loans. Our community college comprised of four divisions, which is the Division of Art, Humanities, and Science, the Division of Technical Education, the Division of Teachers' Education, and the Division of Nurses. Um, nursing Education. On our island, there are four medical, medical schools, and the University of the West Indies has an open campus here. But as our young people, prepare for a country that is developing with an international airport coming to St. Vincent in 2007, 2017, sorry, and a number of major hotels now about to set up in St. Vincent and the Grandines. It is important to note that there is a strong drive towards technical vocation education here in St. Vincent and the Grandines. Even within the other Caribbean islands, and especially within the OECS, that is taking place. Our early childhood um, program have included new standards, new education standards for early childhood education. And our Education Act um, engage or give power to the Minister of Education to authorize schools to operate in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. As you look at our system, many of our young people are faced with problems with literacy and numeracy. And at secondary school level, our, our principals are challenged with developing programs that will upgrade or be able to help 
um, our students improve their literacy and their numeracy. We are presently back at school from last Monday. That is all primary schools and all secondary schools and early childhood centers across the country. And as part of this program, the government engaged through the Ministry of Education, the Education Advisory Board, which comprise of 18 different organizations. Um, the Principals Association of Primary School and Secondary Schools, the Teachers Union, the Early Childhood Association, the University of the West Indies, a representative from the community college, and representative from the Ministry of Health. And this advisory board, along with other bodies, set up a task force to do consultation across the country. As a, as a result, we were able to engage all major stakeholders in finding out how they feel about students returning to school. I must note that in St. Vincent, there is no community transmission. All cases of COVID, which are about 61 at this present state, have been imported. And we, we engage all stakeholders. The students had a voice in saying that they are ready to return to school, that we must return to school under the protocols. And as a result of that, a number of things were put in place for us to return to school. The thermometers, the, thermometer, the temperature checks, the hand washing station, new sanitization policies for school, among them. But as we look at how we can move our students forward, we, we have to spend an emphasis, and I want to emphasize that while they are online school, and while our teachers were involved in online school in the last, they were assistant to, for training during the Principals Association of Secondary School with the assistance of RSC, which is Restore Sense of ICANN out of Trinidad and Tobago. And I know the Caribbean Principals Association have done tremendous training for principals across the, the region and teachers. As a result of that, we were able to help our students to continue some learning at school. But there are many challenges with online learning, as we all will agree. Students without devices, students without electricity, students without internet. And now that the universities are not doing a lot of courses face-to-face, -face, some of our students, especially those who are going off to Trinidad and Jamaica and Barbados, where we have the University of the West Indies, are not able to go. They are doing some online classes. And we, we want to ensure that our students continue to develop. We want to encourage the development of our students students in literacy in numeracy and technical vocation education as we prepare them for the job market because we have a shortage of skilled personnel in, in our nation as a developing country so we will we continue to work together with all the principals association around the caribbean and we seek to develop programs that will help to enhance the leadership of principals and a few thursdays ago we were privileged to have james and early as part of Thoughtful Thursday with the Caribbean Principals Association. And we will network with our, our partners around the world to develop the capacity of our principals and teachers to lead a generation of young people into the next level of education in our region. So with that, I want to sit there and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Curtis. What an inspirational way to finish and lovely to hear uh, the children in the background as well reminds us uh, of the context and the reason why we're doing all this. Um, thank you so much for that. That's absolutely great. Um, I'm going to welcome next uh, Louise uh, Miselka, who is the principal of Guernsey College of Further Education. Uh, I'm going to share your slides just now, Louise, uh, and right. then just give me a little shout when you want me to move them on. Okay. Uh, thank you so much and it's great to be here um, talking to you all today on what is a lovely sunny afternoon actually in Guernsey. So I'm going to talk to you and share just a little bit about um, the apprenticeship scheme that we have in Guernsey. If you just move on Holly. Um, one of the challenges that we have in being a small island, can you move on to the next slide Ollie? Thank oh, you. you. This one? Sorry, can you move on to the next slide? 
sorry, Louise. We're um, the one with the one with Guernsey on yeah. is the one that's showing at the moment. Perfect. I'm not sure why Hi, it's Ali. not moved on in your screen. Hi, Ali. We can only see the front slide, and it's not oh, okay. My mistake. mistake. If you if you can put it in display Thanks, mode, as well, so we can see the whole thing. Thank you. Could you put it in um, presentation mode, Ali? Is that is that working now? No, I'm going to stop sharing, and then maybe you can try again because I think it's delayed okay. on your side with the sharing. Sorry, Louise, we'll get there between That's us. That's all right. That's all right. Got to have some technical issues, haven't you? Exactly. There you go. That's perfect. Yeah, perfect. So I'm just going to talk to you about um, a small island challenge, actually, which I'm sure a lot of you face. Um, in particular, uh, thinking about um, work and the future of work and um, sustaining the economy in a small island, it's particularly hard to um, offer the breadth and depth um, of education post-16 in technical and professional education um, when you've got very small numbers um, and together with a secondary challenge of how do you retain uh, the population on island to carry on learning and to be um, uh, productive citizens of the local economy because I'm sure like many of you we have a lot of young people who will leave the island either for further and higher education and then stay away for a period of time before they perhaps want to come back in their mid to late 30s to raise a family. So that's why we we have paid particular attention to apprenticeship which I'm going to talk to you about. So just so that you know where we are we are a very small Channel Island um, in the middle of the um, channel there, uh, south of the United Kingdom, and just off the coast of northern France. Guernsey is a really small, small island. We have a population of about 63,000. We're not part of the United Kingdom. We're completely independent, but we are part of the British Isles. And actually, Guernsey um, ha is part of a bailiwick of islands, which is made up of small, four much smaller islands. And the education system actually provides education for all of those four islands. Can you move me on, Ollie? So, as I said, um, we've got a small population. Um, we are a low tax jurisdiction and one of the biggest uh, sectors on the island is the finance sector and associated services and actually that's probably one of the largest employers. Relatively spe speaking, we have quite high employment until quite recently um, and I'm sure like many of you the COVID uh, pandemic is, is uh, playing havoc with some of the employment possibilities on the island um, but up until very recently we had quite high employment and I've listed there some of the other um, sectors that are also big employers for the island construction and engineering uh, the digital sector is um, growing increasingly on the island we are a holiday destination island as well, so hospitality and tourism is very prevalent um, and it's a massive problem for that sector in terms of recruitment actually. Um, and, and then obviously retail uh, as a sector continues to be quite big and lastly um, we actually have quite a large uh, government, quite a large civil service uh, that is a, is a large employer of, of um, young people and people entering into work. Can you move me on? Next slide. Thank you. So just a little bit about us. Um, the College of Further Education, for which I work, is the provider, the main provider of further and higher education on the island. Um, and actually the compulsory education age in, in Guernsey is you can leave school at 16. Um, we have quite a high engagement rate of about 80 to 85% of young people do stay on post 16, but you can leave school at 16. Um, over the last few years, um, the compulsory education system and also um, further and higher education have undergone significant reform and at the moment we're currently right slap back in the middle of an education reform which is a root and branch 
look at the way that the whole system works for both primary, secondary and further and higher education. And the college that I work in is just about to merge with two other institutions on the island, a private training provider which delivers lots of uh, specialist technical uh, education for the finance sector specifically, and also the Institute of Health Studies which delivers all of the training required for um, nursing and associated professions. Particularly, um, what we have done is spent some time looking at how we can sustain um, education for work on the island in order to meet those two challenges that I, I identified at the beginning. How do we offer the breadth and depth of curriculum and afford to offer the breadth and depth of curriculum when we have relatively small numbers? How can we meet industry demand? But equally, how do we retain talent on island um, and boost economic prosperity by people being um, economically active in the community? And the way that we have looked at that is through apprenticeship learning. Can you read me on Ollie? What we've done over the last two or three years is taken a root and branch review at our apprenticeship scheme and I'm sure like uh, many of you um, we have had um, up until very recently what could be described as um, a vibrant and positive apprenticeship opportunity in the island based on a very traditional model. And that model was working with employers, um, primarily focused in uh, traditional professions such as construction engineering, hospitality and catering, hairdressing, beauty therapy, um, working with them for a 20% off the job model of education and training where they employed um, a person and then uh, release them on a day release model into the college and what we found was we weren't really meeting labour market demand. We were um, in a organised in such a way that we couldn't respond to industry or emerging sectors in the community and um, as a result of that we undertook a review in partnership with our local industries. Can you move me on Ollie? The review took um, a number of years. Not only did we engage significantly with local employers and local employment sector groups, but we also looked globally at different apprenticeship models to try and understand what would meet the particular needs of an island community and a very small island population. As I said, we're about 63,000 and the working population is about 40,000. We are quite small. Um, following that engagement with local industry and obviously looking to research and more globally at uh, apprenticeship models, we have redefined our apprenticeship system and it is really a partnership working with local employers um, and us as an education provider to develop the curriculum. What's most important about that is the partnership work um, has allowed us to um, engage with employers in such a way that they are not only um, releasing their employees to come in for their learning but the employers or employment sectors are defining the elements of the curriculum. It's a very granular level. So for example, we've recently developed an, an apprenticeship in the, for the retail sector and employers from across the retail sector sat down with us <clears throat> to identify exactly what elements of learning were needed that were right for the Guernsey context and have helped us build that curriculum in such a way that really meets their demands and their needs. So um, that's been really, really successful. We were also able to, working with local industry, to build in um, entry criteria for apprenticeship up until very recently there, there weren't any which actually had the impact of kind of lowering the status amongst young people 
of apprenticeship and the notion of apprenticeship. So by building an entry criteria, we've been able to raise the aspiration that actually an apprenticeship is a worthwhile and aspirational um, thing to think about when you're looking at your next steps as a young person. If you just move me on, Ollie. So just some information for you. Um, we are currently working with over 400 employers for our apprenticeship. And I said at the very beginning, the apprenticeship on the island has been around for about 70 years and has been very successful. So much so that I think probably almost every house that's been built in the last 70 years almost certainly would have had an apprentice working on that building site. But in the last two years, we've undergone a reform so that we can respond more quickly and swiftly to employer needs as the changing face of work develops. We're working with industry groups now to look at higher level apprenticeships as well so that we really do have those progression pathways um, across the industries and up through the industry. So it may be that apprenticeships are available for 16 year olds, but equally they may be available for 18 year olds or mid, mid career people who wish to um, change career and look at apprenticeship as an option. Equally, the opportunity to have higher level apprenticeships locally means that the local population can engage with higher education while working and perhaps avoid um, some of the uh, cost of higher education for our local population because I'm sure like many of you, um, higher education is quite costly to go off island and uh, go to a UK or international university. As part of the apprenticeship, we have had um, a grant available for small to medium <clears throat> size enterprises. It's a very small grant and obviously that's provided by the government. Up until our review two years ago, it was a universal grant. So it didn't really matter what size of business you were or indeed whether you were um, an industry skill shortage business, um, you could uh, obtain a universal grant. And as part of the review, we've re-looked at that, working again with a group of employers to help inform what was going to work for local industries. And we've defined that so that small um, employers, perhaps one or two uh, man bands, if you like, can apply for a small grant in the first two years that they take on an apprentice to support that knowledge and skills gap that a new employee might have as they begin their program of study. What we're seeing since we've undertaken the review is increasing numbers of um, school leavers wishing to uh, undertake an apprenticeship. I've just given you some data there. In 2018, 10% of school leavers at 16 embarked on an apprenticeship and this year it was 12%. I know that's only a tiny increase, but actually this year have, we have been impacted by COVID. And um, what we're finding is local employers are saying that they don't want to take on an apprentice at the moment because of an economic downturn. However, what we're doing is looking at um, different entry points onto an apprenticeship and we'll have entry points later on in the academic year. So should things pick up, hopefully, um, we will be able to uh, restart apprentices uh, later on in the academic year. Our target is actually to have 25% of all school leavers um, enrolling on an apprenticeship by 2025. And of course, the the beauty of an apprenticeship in a small island context is whilst the cost, the long term cost of the training is still the same to the taxpayer, by having an apprenticeship, the cost in year is less than an equivalent full time student. And that helps to give some degree of sustainability to be able to for us to be able to provide that specialist education skills around technical professional qualifications. 
So interesting to see that the average age of our apprenticeships is between our apprentices is between 20 and 24 years of age. And I think that's primarily because many local employers will want to take um, on an apprentice, perhaps if they've had a little bit of experience, they're 18 plus our apprenticeships, depending on the um, on the qualifications that students are doing can be anything from two to five years in duration. Can you just move me on, Ollie? Last slide. So I just want to sum up what I've shared with you today. We're at the uh, very start of a new model of apprenticeship for our community. But at the heart of that model is the notion of partnership, real partnership, which has helped create the curriculum which working together is meeting the local economic needs and that partnership is between the employer, the provider and obviously the student. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Louise. Great presentation and really fascinating to hear about such a great um, history and heritage of apprenticeships. I love the point you made about, you know, every, every, island, every house on the island uh, being built. That's such a wonderful uh, kind of notion. So thank you so much for, for joining us. That was absolutely great. Uh, and last but not least, I'd love to welcome Dr. Arlene Smith-Thompson. Um, Arlene and I met at one of our recent uh, uh, research conferences when you were doing your PhD, I think, over here in the UK. Um, and Arlene is a higher education consultant uh, in the Virgin Islands. Um, so just to finish off our age range from Anna in the early years, uh, Arlene's going to take us through to, uh, to, to further and higher education. Um, over to you, Arlene. Thank you, Arlene. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, that's great. We can hear you. Um, and do you want to share your, your, your slides? Yes, I can go ahead and share my slides. Perfect. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. If you just want to go into presentation mode, we'll see them okay. nice, a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. It's just the slideshow menu at the top and then a view, view show. Should get you there. Right, um, slide uh, slideshow right at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. then view show. Don't worry, Arlene. We, we can see them we can see them well enough. So um yeah. you just get started. That's absolutely fine. Oh but, okay. Okay. All right. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Thank you, Ali. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Good morning, everyone. And um, it's, a, it's a great day here in the British Virgin Islands, and I'm so happy to be a part of this prestigious conference. My presentation today is going to be focused on the concept of students becoming in the age of COVID-19 and what are some challenges and opportunities for higher and further education in our context of the, the Virgin Islands. Um, just as a way of background information, we are an overseas territory of the United Kingdom. And I know a lot of persons have been saying their context are quite small, ours is even smaller. So we are comprised of about 40 islands and islets. Our population is just around 35,000 with a GDP of about 34,200 per capita. Our main industries are tourism and financial services. We have a, a parliamentary democracy style of government, internal self-government. Our education system, we have a compulsory education between the ages of 5 to 16. We do have a very high literacy rate on the island uh, of about 98%. Uh, tertiary level institutions, we have one main institution where I currently work as a consultant at this point in time. We also have a satellite uh, College of the University of the West Indies, 
that's located here, a satellite campus. If you look at the map, I'm presently on Tortola. Okay, so this is the biggest island and we have, um, most of these islands are uninhabited, but we have like, Virgin Water, Anigada, and Yosemite. Lake. They're the main um, islands that are populated and um, quite, a, quite attractive to tourists. I'm going to preface my presentation quickly by talking about the concept of becoming very quickly. I know most of you will be familiar with Michelle Obama's book on becoming. She actually popularized the concept last year when she came up with that book. But um, I've actually been doing some research on it for of the last four or five years because the whole concept or I would call it a philosophical construct of becoming is an under-researched area in education. And I just want to use another example as to why I think it is important to consider a becoming construct, even within the higher education environment. Uh, I'll just use my son as a quick example. He just graduated university with a bachelor's degree in English with honors. And then here comes COVID-19. And he, I think he has struggled in terms of how does he see himself fitting in in, in the world today. Uh, yes, he has knowledge. Yes, he has skills. But I don't think he really appreciates how he can possibly contribute to maybe sustainable development of our country in the future. And I think this is a challenge for a lot of our young people now coming of age with COVID-19. And I just thought that this would be an opportune time to share some of the findings of my research in that regard. Uh, providing education during emergencies has really become a norm here in the British Virgin Islands. I'm sure a lot of you may have heard about the destruction of the hurricanes in 2017, Hurricanes Irma and Maria where about 70% of our buildings sustained major damage. Even the house that I'm in here right now, we lost all of the content. This was that serious. Disrupted our entire school system. And we were just on the way back. And here comes COVID-19. And of course, as a number of you, the presenters have been saying, you know, you had to do a lot of shifting in terms of your teaching and learning. And if it's a new paradigm, that is emerging because all of a sudden our systems are no longer stable and, and they're very unpredictable. And the thing is how, how do we go on within, the push, within COVID-19 um, as, as, as we have to live with it, so to speak, and then how would we even emerge from this? Of course, it presents problems for our, our country, but as Paulo Freire said, Problem posing education affirms men and women as being in the process of becoming. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of where we are. Um, it was really good to hear some of the presentations talking about the challenges that you were facing in early childhood and you know in just in other, other stages of the, your education system, other levels. And we pretty much, I would say we are in the same boat. So our education ministry it's doing an, an, an excellent job as they try to engage all of the actors <clears throat> and stakeholders in our education system because we we obviously had to move to an online system of education it was really good to see the presenter from st vincent from the Grenadines, where their students are in school but ours are not and so it is providing for their needs uh, within within this, this this environment and for the most part i would say that our education sector is doing its best. So I have some thoughts here of um, our, 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 our Minister for Education. Um, they, they've been trying their best to engage the community in terms of where we are in our various learning platforms. Our college is also trying out its best to reach out to students to make sure that things are as seamless as possible. So here we are with 
what I consider to be an opportunity for our higher education environment. Um, again, I'll use our, our college, our main college, Lake Laverty Stark Community College, as an example. I think we do an excellent job of imparting knowledge to our students. We have a, a, a whole division of workforce training that, that capitalizes on a lot of the skills needs in the territory. But is it just sufficient for us to have knowledge and skills? Is it just sufficient to prepare our students in this area? And I, I beg to, to differ. I think now even, with, I think what COVID-19 has revealed is that we probably still need to do a bit more. And one of the philosophers that I have been researching over the last few years is the work of Yilis Toulouse, uh, where he, he, he probably was a little ahead of his time in, in, in looking at that whole becoming an, an ontology. How can being human beings be all that they can be in a world that, that emphasizes difference, for instance, and, and, and you have a lot of subjectivity? And, the, you know, and all of this is merging in, in, in a world where a lot of our systems could be in a state of flux. And what Yus Duluth is saying is that we must look at how to ensure that our students can become all that they can be and not just necessarily rely on institutional structures, which, which could very well be static at best. Then I also looked at another philosopher. I tried to combine both of them because I think at the heart of this discussion is that yes, you can have knowledge and yes, you can have skills, but it's, in, it's just important to understand how humans really function in the world. And Amartya Sen, who's an Indian philosopher, he has done a, a pretty good job, I would say, of bringing this to the fore. So he speaks of the need to have human beings value you know what is important to them and so that's term functioning then you have a, a capability and his, his model is really called a capability approach to human development and uh, it's, you, so you're combining whatever skills knowledge and skills that you're capable of doing and then that you have the autonomy to to undertake you know the, 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 these skills and to impart knowledge in ways that we see fit. So together, they're packaged to, to sort of put forth a picture of, of humans and how they can really function in the world. And then I just came up with this model of, of how I think education, and not just higher education, but education on the whole, could be considered. Um, you have becoming and different. You have capability on the other hand, and then you have your higher education and further education curricula. And I think again, in the age of COVID-19, here is where there's an opportunity for us to do things a bit differently. So because basically what you want is to allow your young people, especially that might need higher education and further education, the freedom to make choices, the freedom to think outside the box, the freedom to do whatever they see is the ways that they can really contribute to sustainable development. And so that brings me to really the, the, the heart of this discussion and maybe just some points that we should really be thinking about in terms of human being in the world today. And I pose a number of questions here for higher education and further education designers. In the age of COVID-19 and even post-COVID-19, because we're hoping that at some point, hopefully soon, we will be out of this, this health threat. What should we really be teaching that could benefit students in a post-COVID-19 world? How should we teach it? Which is really the heart of, 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 of your curriculum emphasis. Is a knowledge-based curriculum adequate? Is a focus on skills training adequate? And I noticed that a number of presentations 
have focused on, on that and we, we're experiencing some of the same challenges in a very small context. So yes, you need to have the skills, you need to have apprenticeship training, et cetera. But then are our young people really contributing in meaningful ways to our society? And here is where a becoming ontology can help to sort of bridge those gaps. So to what extent then is an understanding of human being and their ultimate becoming important? Should more priority be placed on this on the research area? And in my view, it should be given more priority because the idea is to really be preparing your, your students for their place or their places in the world. And I just want to conclude uh, by just emphasizing a, a quote from Ronald Barnett, Professor Ron, Ronald Barnett, who's actually one of the few researchers that have really looked in depth at the whole concept of becoming and how it links to knowledge within a higher education and further education curriculum. And the point that he strongly makes is that working out the connection between knowing and being or becoming requires a thinking through of the kind of human being that we want our students to become. And that, it, and that is partly a matter of, 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 of our value choices or our value system. So in other words, it's going to vary from one context to the other. So in essence, that's my very brief presentation today. I really thank you for listening. And I am glad that Michelle Obama, she popularized becoming, but it really brought to the fore that this sort of construct can actually be used in an education setting as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arlene. What a thoughtful presentation and a great way to finish the, the set of presentations. Um, can I ask all of the speakers to, to join me back on the stage? Um, uh, and Arlene, just to reflect back, I think, well, A, I bet you wish you uh, had a royalty every time Michelle Obama sold a book. Um, but also, <laughs> that would be nice. That would be nice. But I think you, you alighted on a point that I think is really dear to our hearts and I think has come up uh, across nearly all of the presentations which is just around the, the idea that, you know, knowledge really isn't enough anymore. Uh, and actually, whether young people are in an island setting or in a mainland setting, we need to do better by them by giving them a range of knowledge, a range of skills, yeah. a range of behaviours, uh, whether that's in a school setting, as Jan was talking about, whether it's in an early year setting, as Anna was talking about, or in an apprenticeship setting, as Louise was talking about. So um, I feel like that's a really strong message uh, from your research and from your practice. Um, we've got a bit of time for uh, questions. I know there's lots of questions uh, that people have asked, so we're not going to get through all of them. But I wanted to just start with um, a, a theme that's come up in several of your areas, which is just about looking to the future and the developing labour market in your different situations. And just to ask really, how do, you, how do you find those growth industries? How do you plan rather than just for the jobs that you've got today, for the ones that you know we graze into our crystal ball and we hope that young people might be having in two three five years uh louise you're looking like you want to come in on that one yeah <laughs> i suppose it's a, it's it's two things isn't it it's looking globally and um looking at different employment trends but also looking at the research and what the big thinkers are, are talking about in terms of the changing face of work, um, you know, automation, artificial intelligence and all of those things. Are we heading towards a jobs apocalypse or are we, is it going to be gradual sort of evolution in, in the way that we're working? So I think it's that, but I also think, um, I can't stress enough how important it is to actually talk to local employers and international employers to get what they're thinking about um, the future of work now and also, you know, what they're planning for in five, ten years. So I think it, it's those two things. I think getting an understanding, looking at the research, looking at the big thinking, but also talking to people that are on your doorstep about what they want and need. Great answer, Louise. Does anyone else want to give a different perspective on that one? Um, i just like to say I agree with, with Louise, but I think those um, meta skills, those timeless meta skills are, are the key, actually, because what I think they do, if you're thinking about um, people who are good at problem solving and, and team working and communication, a lot of those skills are, are difficult to, to automate. Um, and I think we've all seen, uh, we've certainly seen over here, 
that when we had shut down due to COVID-19, people transferred from, from one area of employment or one sector of employment to another. And with a little bit of technical knowledge, it was that, um, that those meta skills, those timeless meta skills, those other skills that probably they just assume everybody's got that actually enabled them to move from one area to another. And um, so I would say, I, I agree with Louise, but I think the, there's another thing there and it is about those, those broad transferable skills. And I don't think always as educationalists, we, we make enough of those and yet young people and, and adults are, are developing them um, all the time. Great point, Jan. Now I just wanted to turn to a, a kind of a, a, an, an issue that's maybe a particular challenge for, for islands, maybe smaller islands in terms of getting the right kind of staff and personnel with the skills to be great trainers. Um, and Anna, I want to come to you on this one first. I know it's an area that's dear to your heart, but uh, what's the answer here? Is it, is it all about homegrown talent? Is it about uh, online learning? Is it about um, importing the right people? How do we get the right trainers for those crucial industries, whether it's early years education or, um, I don't know, um, high tech construction? Well, um, as far as early childhood education goes, um, I think where we are at at the moment in Malta is that finally we do have people who are actually uh, trained to train others. We're not at the ideal point, but now as compared to say 20 years ago, when we, there was actually hardly anybody, you know, maybe two, three persons who were actually graduated in early years. Now, at least there are more. But I think one of the syndrome uh, of being a small island is that as soon as you graduate, you can become an ex expert. <laughs> and that is not necessarily so, right? Everybody looks at you as being an expert and a lot is demanded of you. I mean, yes, there are people who then go on to research, you know, and try to upgrade their skills or whatever. But I think in a way we still depend a little bit on international um, people who are more knowledgeable than us. But the problem that I see there, or perhaps it's not a problem, but it's an issue, um, is that sometimes we try to um, make what worked for them work for us without keeping in mind that the context is different, that the culture is different, that the size of the country is different. For example, um, we like to compare ourselves to Finland and their way of education. It's a beautiful way of education and we all agree that that is where we need to go. But we can't actually say that we can take it as it is in Finland and put it in Malta. We have no greenery. We have nowhere where the children can learn outside on concrete, that's all, even the schoolyards have hardly any greenery. You know, we don't have snow either, so that doesn't count either, right? <laughs> so we can only, that is what I wish that we would do, that we take the principles, you know, of their pedagogy and try and adapt it to our country. And I think that all islands need to do that. We cannot compare ourselves to the bigger countries who have more resources than us financially, you know, um, human resources, all other resources. Okay, so I, that is my opinion, at least. Yeah, that's a great point, Anna. I think um, that there's uh, there's a lot to be said in that. Um, Arlene will be familiar, like me as a researcher, with some of the literature around uh, policy borrowing and policy learning. So, uh, you know, we're always discouraging um, people, whether they're in an island or not, from just taking a policy from another context exactly. and dropping it into your own and thinking it might work the same. Uh, as you say, everyone's context is very different. Uh, and uh, it, you may have more to more more in common with other islands than with the snowy nations of Scandinavia. Um, <laughs> um, Ali, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah. I wondered with your kind of HE perspective. Right. Yes. Um, in terms of training of teachers, uh, I'm happy to report that our, our education needs to be recognizing that there is a gap there. Uh, a lot of our teachers they may have professional degrees, but not necessarily trained in teacher education. So with that being said, we, we seem to need to establish a dedicated institution as part of our, our college 
environment where we focus on teacher education training. So that's the common theme at least by early next year. So we're really happy about that. In terms of the wider population, um, the majority of our workforce is, is expatriate. So again, you know, we, we don't we don't have the skills necessarily resident on the island in a lot of areas. And again, I think we're just a victim of smallness. So you know, these are the areas that we really want to focus on how we can train our young people to, to take up jobs in our local economy. And that's why I was so happy to hear about that apprenticeship pre um, presentation, because I think we need to do more of that. We have some of it, but I think it's, it's not enough. That's really helpful, Arlene. Thank you so much. Um, Curtis, it was great to hear how you have managed to get your students back to school, uh, uh, which is wonderful, um, and that you haven't got any community uh, transmission. But I wanted to ask you, and then I'll, I'll come to each of the panelists on this one just to finish this off. But uh, obviously, the last few months have been hard for everyone around the world for lots of different reasons. But um, if you had to take kind of a lesson or something uh, as a positive reflection from the period with COVID uh, that might kind of be something we could reflect on or change for the future, uh, what would you what would you choose from St. Vincent and the Grenadines? I think it's the, if you hear my woodwork tools running in the background, is a sign of my students being involved in technical vocational education. And um, I wanted to mention earlier about the importance in St. Vincent, we have a uh, the Education Advisory Board, which is also comprised of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So we get a lot of feedback from the employers about what the job market requires and what is the demand there. But in terms of COVID itself, um, the, the ability to adopt at short notice of our teachers and students was one of the strengths that came out. Um, you, you know we are living in a society, in a world, where the children seem that they're more inclined in a dis digital age than us, um, the adults. And they were able to adapt quickly to the technology where some of our students, uh, um, our teachers were fighting with the technology. Um, but the, the willingness for them to learn new skill set in order to educate the young people that are in our care. Um, that is one of the positive things that came out of the COVID period. And that is helping us say, in St. Vincent Grandines and the entire Caribbean, as I speak on behalf of the Caribbean Principals Association as well. Wonderful example, Curtis. Yeah, and I know from some research we've done in the UK recently how uh, teachers have really uh, ad adopted and are keen to make use of the best of online technology or blended learning uh, going forward. And some of the things they've perhaps been forced to do in the last few months that they might not otherwise have done, they really want to take the positives from those and continue them. So thanks, that's a great example. Um, Jan, do you want to share a, a lesson from the Isle of Man next? Um, I think it's a similar one to, to Curtis's. I, I think, um, you know, that shift all of a sudden to being online, I think it, it certainly will help us move forward with a lot of the, the blended learning and flipped learning approaches that we've been working with, with schools around. And also, um, one, of the, one of the key things, particularly for, for young children, is, is that engagement um, with their parents around what good learning is. So, I talked about the six R's earlier, but I know some of our primary schools um, set uh, work that was around things, uh, activities that they did at home, which was things like cooking or gardening or something like that. But it was all based around the, those six R's. And I think by parents being involved in that, they actually see perhaps more why those are important, not just for, for very young children, but how it relates perhaps to, to how they work in in, in the, you know in their daily lives as well and um, I think the other bit is is actually how um, as an island and as a community we came together I think mm. that that that's that we had a real challenge um, and, and we and we really did work together to sort of problem solve and move forward with with lots of different aspects and and, and that has been a positive a, a very difficult and, and challenging time for us Thank you, Jan. That's a really positive note. Um, Anna? Uh, well, for us, it was the same. As, as I said, even in my presentation, that this was so sudden mm. that nobody was expecting it really, you know, to have to change to online learning. And But I think there is a positive side to it. And the most positive thing that I see about, I have to agree with Jan, is about parents. 
I think parents having had to work with children, right? Be the parent, be the um, educator, have their own job, you know, their own career, um, they could actually uh, appreciate the educator's work and how children learn. That children do not only learn through academically structured subject, but also through everyday life. As you were saying, Jen, even through the cooking that was being done, there were so many posts on the media about young children um, starting to cook. You know, there was a particular girl, a Maltese girl actually, who I was following because she set up her own video clips on Facebook of her telling us how to cook with instructions and everything. And she was so good. Like if maybe perhaps if this COVID hadn't happened, she would not have had that opportunity. So I think we need to take this COVID um, new norm, you know, as being something positive as well. But as we all said, we need the training to be able to cope with it. It's not something that is easy, either on the educators and not even on the children. It is something very different and everybody uh, reacts to it differently. For us, for example, in Malta, kindergartens and schools have not started yet. We usually start around the 28th of um, September. The guidelines for the, the protocol sort of, of for the primary and secondary school are already out, but the ones for kindergartens are not. So all the teachers, like the early childhood educators are, you know, don't know what's going to happen to them, don't know what, how they should be planning. And, you know, I think it should be different. There were six months already that passed of COVID. And I think we had ample time, you know, to be able to prepare ourselves for the coming scholastic year, which I hope will be a good one in spite of everything else. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Anna. Um, Arlene, a lesson from the Virgin Islands. Yes, um, I just want to pick up on what Anna is saying about the early childhood sector. Unfortunately, that is the sector that is being impacted the most. A lot of our early childhood providers, all of the centers, as a matter of fact, they're currently closed. So you have these very young children, they have to be home with their parents, who some of them still are expected to also go to work. So it's, it's, it's really a, a, an unfortunate situation. And um, as an education researcher, what I'm concerned about most is that there is going to be a gap in our education system in terms of what students should know by a certain age level if we don't address the needs of the early childhood sector in particular. So you can have um, in the next five to 10 years, for instance, we can see that our students may not be as well prepared as they should be because we didn't address these needs now. So I, I fully agree with Anna, because we're facing some of the same challenges here right now in the BVI. The youngest, the most vulnerable of our student population, they are, they are underserved. And I think it's not intentional, but it's just that no, no one really knows what to do with this particular um, population of learners in terms of um, how to adequately meet their needs. So it's something I, I would be happy to share um, <laughs> with, with, with other colleagues from the different islands in terms of how, you know, any of your best practices that can also yeah. help in our context. Yeah. That's great, Arlene. Thank you. And Louise, you get the last word on lessons from okay. COVID. I think for me, it was, it was two things. Um, the first thing is the amazing community spirit. And I think um, that's already been mentioned. But particularly from an education perspective, um, the sort of community of learning that occurred as a result of COVID and how um, various people, organizations in the community were willing to support learning really rapidly. Lots and lots of third sector organizations putting stuff out for parents and um, so on and young people. But I think the most profound um, thing for me was the power of imposed transformation and how quickly we all moved when it was imposed mm -hmm. and and that goes against sometimes how difficult it is in 
in, with change management and how challenging that can be for all of us. But actually when it was imposed, boom, we, we did it overnight. There was a massive realization um, for us as an organization about the amount of digital poverty in our community with our young people. So our students 16 plus that was largely hidden until COVID. But again, with that community spirit and the community of learning that occurred, we were able to support a lot of students that didn't have access to technology that they needed to carry on their learning. So I think it was those two things, power of transformation and community <laughs> spirit. Brilliant. What a great place to, to finish. So I, I could talk to you uh, guys all day. Thank you so much. What brilliant presentations. Uh, absolutely loved it. Uh, you need to imagine a round of applause from the audience because obviously that can't happen in these days. But I know that from the comments that everyone really enjoyed it. So huge thanks to your time. Huge thanks to everyone who tuned in. Uh, you can contact me or any of the panelists through the, the system if you've got further follow up questions. Uh, and otherwise, have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.